So last week we started our series on uh, Elijah. And uh, if you do have your Bibles this morning, we're going to open to Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, as you're turning there, I just want to say something. So, um, so it's so important to God that you hear this, okay? Above anything else in our lives, God wants us to have all of our hearts, all of our worship, all of our focus, and our adoration. That's what God wants. God wants to be number one in your life and in your hearts. In fact, the very first of the Ten Commandments, commandment number one says, God, you shall have no other gods before me. So when Jesus was questioned, what is the most important commandment? Jesus said, above, above all else, we are to love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God wants all of our hearts, not just one piece of it. Which gives us good reason, which gives good reason if you're Satan, if you are the spiritual enemy, what would you try to do to God's people? You'd try to hurt their hearts. You'd try to go after them in their hearts. And sure, if I was Satan, I would try to take your heart of the people away from the one true God and, and try to get people to worship and serve false gods, and, which is something that Satan's been doing throughout history. He has been trying to distract God's people and God's church with other things. So putting false gods in the place of one true God is called the sin of idolatry. So that's kind of the key thought for today, okay? I want you to think about this. This is the whole premise of the... I'm not really good at keeping my major points till the end. I always tell them at the beginning, so if you feel like you need to leave, you can go now. Okay, here it is. False gods promise only what the true God provides. False gods promise what only true, the true God can provide. For example, money is a pretty popular false God. Money is, is very pop, okay? It's very popular. What, what does money do? Money promises what only God can provide. Money says if you have enough money, you'll be happy, you'll be secure. That's what many people believe about the false god of money. But the reality is that once you get enough money and then someone says to you, hey, you have cancer and you're going to die in 30 days, you realize it didn't matter how much money you had. It doesn't make you secure. It's, it's a false promise. Money says if you have enough, you'll be happy. But it doesn't matter how much money you have, you may not be happy with all the money in the world. And, and there, there are stats and, 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 and research that show that some of the wealthiest people in the world talk about all the money that they have. And, and, and he's like, are you happy? And they're like, no, I'm not happy because ha money doesn't bring happiness. It makes certain things a little bit easier, but it doesn't make you happy. See, it's a false promise. And one day you found that you've lost your children and, and there's no amount of money that can bring back those moments, for example. It's a false promise. It's a false God. It promises something that it does not provide. So, in the life of Elijah, many people were living idolatrous lives. They were worshiping and serving false gods. So if you weren't here last week, I'm going to give you a quick recap of what I talked about. Elijah was called by God to confront a very, very evil king named Ahab who was married to this wicked woman named Jezebel. Ahab was the 19th consecutive evil king, okay? Like he is 19th in a row, bad person, evil, evil, evil. And scripture says that he did more evil in the eyes of God than any before him. And so he was the worst of the worst, and all his long list of sins and wickedness, the worst thing that he did was he continued turning the hearts of the people away from the one true God and turn them to Baal and Asherah. So Baal was the sun god or the fire god. Uh, Asherah was this kind of like Baal's wife situation. And the people were no longer worshiping the god of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. Instead, they were worshiping these false gods. The false gods promised, if you worship me, we'll make your crops grow. And if you worship me, then you'll have a better life. False gods promised when only true god the only true God provides. So God raises up Elijah, who confronts the king and basically says, because of your idolatry, God has sent me to tell you that it is not going to reign in this kingdom until God says it's going to reign after I pray to him. 
So there's this major drought, right? And tons of people are dying. And God sends Elijah into this period of hiding and preparation. Why? Because King Ahab wanted him dead, obviously. He said to everybody, you find him, you kill him on the spot. They put a hit out on, on Elijah. And so God takes Elijah into a place called Kareth Ravine, which we talked about last week. Um, and, and, and if you were here last week, it means a place of cutting or cutting down. And it's a place of humbling where God humbled him and developed him into an even stronger man of God. This is Elijah. God fed him by morning and by evening by ravens who flew in, would drop bread and meat. And, and then he, he drank at a brook. And we talked about how this brook, this ravine in the middle of a drought kept going. God's got an interesting sense of humor. But one day this brook dried up, so God called him to move on to a place known as Zarephath, where there was a widow, and God used to provide for him just a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour, and they had this miraculous feast of bread. Never ran dry. And one day the widow's son died. This growing man of faith took the son up to the upper room, called out to God, and God raised this boy from the dead. And see, we, we see that the prophet was being developed into a man of God, and God wanted to use him. So we, we, we come to this last verse, and we're, we're, we're told that Elijah goes into hiding. God wants him to go and confront an evil king. That's where he was, and now God says, okay, go and c confront the king. And this is where we, we pick up our story in chapter uh, 18. So we're about three years into the drought, and in 1 Kings 18, 17 to 18, we see them together for the first time again in, in a chapter in a bit. We, they come back together. Ahab versus Elijah this Sunday on pay-per-view. Yeah. And then the scripture says, when Ahab saw he, Elijah, he said to them, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? You know what that means, right? Hey, hey, is that you, you pain in my butt? Yeah, I said butt in church, okay? Is that you, you troubler of Israel? You, you pain. Now, the, the Hebrew word actually troubler means snake or viper. Hey, you, you no good low down snake, it's your fault all this is happening, Ahab says. All these people are dying with this huge drought because of you, Elijah. And Elijah says, I'm not taking that from you. Or in modern vernacular, not today, Satan. Okay? I'm not taking that from you. And he pops back towards the king, and in verse 18 he says, No, 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 no. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. He said, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command, and, and you have followed the Baals. You have committed the sin of idolatry. And you are putting false gods ahead of the one true God. And Elijah was confronting the very popular idea that there are many gods... Now, I want to give you a couple words that I learned in Bible college, okay? Remember, I, 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 I taught you on the word scubula? Scubula? Anybody remember what that means? Say it out loud. It's okay. It's church. It's biblical. Scubula? Poop? Dung? Right? Okay. 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 You're with me. Okay. Here we go. These are two words that I learned in Bible college. I just told somebody this morning, I, we were talking about grades and everything, and, and my, my, my struggle in Bible college was Greek, and I prayed to the Lord th uh, for three semesters. Lord, let me pass Greek. And guess what, folks? I passed Greek. <sighs> I don't remember anything. Okay. So you may or not may not th well, know these words, but the words are monotheism and polytheism. Okay? So what is monotheism? It's the belief that there is one God. Okay? Monotheistic. One God. And we as Christians, we are monotheistic in our beliefs. Okay? Polytheistic, though, is this belief that there are multiple gods. And Elijah was confronting the very polytheistic culture where they would worship multiple gods for multiple things for multiple reasons. 
If you needed this, you worshipped this God. If you needed this, you worshipped this God. You made a sacrifice to this God. You made an offering to this God. And the list became quite large. It became quite difficult to figure out which God you were supposed to worship for which thing. Now, those of you who are Christians, you would say, well, we're monotheistic. We believe in one true God. But even though we believe in one true God, the reality is that many of us live what I would call a polytheistic life. We believe in God, but in reality, we worship and serve actually many false gods. Most people I know aren't worshiping false gods of Baal and Asherah. But in reality, the false gods today that we worship seem to be much more socially acceptable. So let's be honest. A lot of people worship the false god of money. We've talked about it already. Well, maybe some people worship the false gods of material possessions. You know, your house, your car, your boat, your trailer, your cabin, your... I don't know, maybe, maybe it could be your image. Maybe you like the way you look, and so you put a ton of time into going to the gym and working out and having a swimmer's body like me. We've talked about that, okay? I am built for aqua activities, okay? And, and maybe you spend a lot of time putting on the hair and the makeup and making yourself look really good so that when beach day comes, you can just be like, bam, look at this. Maybe, maybe you really like sports. Like, you are obsessed with sports, and that, that, that becomes the thing. Maybe it's your career. Maybe you just have a, a hobby. I know a guy, uh, he uh, is ob obsessed with golf. Obsessed with golf. I might be related to him through marriage. Okay? Is obsessed with golf. He golfs all the, t all the time. It's wild how much he golfs. But maybe, oddly enough, maybe it could be your children. Maybe you just... I mean, you just love your children so much. Like, how could it be my children? But, but when you elevate anything into a rightful place of the one true God and put anything on the throne of your life besides God, that is adultery. Even something as good and as important as your children. Now, when I was growing up, I'd hear things like this in a message, right? My dad was a preacher, and he, he'd say this, or other people in my, in my life would, would preach these things, and I'd be like, well, that's so harsh. Like, I would always struggle with, like, I, my, my mom and my dad and my siblings and maybe my girlfriend or, you know, whatever it was, and I'd be like, but I really like them, and, like, how could I put, how could I, it's so hard to put God above them, and, like, is God telling me to hate them? Is God telling me to push them aside? Like, how do I, how do I do this? And that's what God was saying. He's saying that if you put them above him, if you, if you worship them, then that's not good. Is God, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then everything else. So what are the false gods that you serve? What, what are the false gods that you put ahead of the one true God? Because I know that even right now, you're probably thinking of some things. You're probably thinking of some things that pop into your head. So, so let, let's be honest. I'll tell you a few of mine. Okay? Get ready. If you want to take blackmail notes, this is the time. Okay? You can, you can use this against me in the future. But probably the number one thing in my life is I've made the church, I've made ministry, I've made all of the, this, this thing kind of the thing. It's what I think about. There have been times in my life where I remember working at churches and there'd be a crisis at home. There'd be something wrong with the kids. There'd be, my wife and I would be having some tension or there'd be like a dramatic moment. And, but someone in the church would call and say, I need this. And which would I attend to? I'd run to the church instead of tending to, to my family. And I've seen it in my family, and I know that there are pastors who deal with this tension all the time. And I put the church first. 
And it's obvious because I'm serving the church. It's my calling. It's what I'm here to do, yet I've made the church number one. Sometimes even above God. Listen, you do this long enough, you're very good at doing church. You're very good at putting on a Sunday, putting on events, putting on things, putting on the thing to make it look good and to smell good and to feel good. But the reality is that I can do church without thinking about it. You can plop me into any Pentecostal church in this country for one Sunday, I can kill it. I'm always ready to preach, pray, and die, as pastors say. But sometimes I put it above God. And I, and I do it in the name of God, and I want to grow the church and save the city and all these things, and it's become this kind of sometimes this idol in my life, and I have to be very careful. In Bible college, we used to read the Bible. Shocking, right? But the Bible became a textbook. It didn't become this life source. It became a textbook, and you have to guard against these things. Another thing, honestly, is, is my family. Family is good. I love my wife. I love my kids. And the truth is that sometimes after the church, I put them ahead of God. I, I, I put them, you know, my kids wake up early, and then I just focus on them, and I want them. And I'm a, and I'm a, I'm a daddy's, like I'm a, I like my little girl. I don't know how else to say it. She's the apple of my eye. She's a little terrorist. And part of me kind of likes it. And, and so she becomes this thing that I put above. Sometimes I've put so many things in the moments above, above God because I'm stressed out or I'm depressed. Yes, pastors get depressed. Um, or, or, you know, the, the, the playoffs are on. Well, I mean, I could pray or I could watch the Edmonton Oilers beat Florida last night. Oh, don't clap. They're terrible, Okay. No, they've won one game. It'll be the only game they get, unfortunately. But <laughs> yeah, they're, it's awful. See, see, yeah, see, making me feel guilty, Lord. So we got to be honest. Where are you with the false gods that you've elevated and erected in the place of the one true God, the sin of idolatry? Sure, we're monotheistic in our beliefs, but our practices often say that we're polytheistic. Okay. And so Elijah, the prophet, steps into this polytheistic culture and makes a very prophetic and very strong statement. He looks at them, okay, and, and as they're going back and forth, he says, with all the authority of God gives them, people, it is time to quit wavering. It's time. Quit wavering between gods. Quit going back, to for, back and forth. It's time to make a decision. And then what he does next... He says, we're going to have a good old-fashioned throwdown. Okay? We're going to have a showdown. My God versus your gods. This is one of my favorite, aside from Ehud. Okay? If you don't know who Ehud is, look him up. Left-handed freak in the Bible. Amazing story. He kills a guy while he's on a toilet. Okay? Just saying. Best story in the Bible. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible because of what happens next. So in, in verse 19 and 21, it says to the king, King, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Now can we just pause for a moment? That has to be one big honking table. He just said 850 people eat at her table. Imagine making that for Thanksgiving. Okay, that is one big honking table. Okay, so verse 20. So Ahab sent the word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Now verse 21 says this. Here's where Elijah gets in the people's faces. Elijah says, he, Elijah went before the people and he asked this piercing question. How long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver? And then he says this. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And interestingly enough, the people said nothing. And he steps in and says, how long are you going to do this then? If God is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. 
And I can guarantee you that if Elijah was here today, he'd say the same thing to you and I. Quit wavering. Quit wavering. Quit putting things ahead of God. Yeah, yeah, but, but God, you know, God, keep me out of hell and get me into heaven, but I still want to do whatever I want. Yeah, but God, hear my prayers and bless me, but I don't want to obey, obey some of your commands. Oh, God, I want all the good things you have, but I don't want to stop doing the bad things that I'm doing. Oh, God, I, you know, oh, God, I. Quit wavering. Quit being a Christian on Sunday and a heathen on Monday. Quit claiming Christ and living like you don't know him. Quit wanting the benefits of Jesus and being unwilling to make the sacrifice. Just quit wavering. That's what Elijah would say. Take a side. In fact, I'm trying to conceptualize Elijah's message here today, and here's what I honestly think he would say. He, he's not going to say, hey, if Baal's got, or if this or that. What he would say, because we'd all just say, Baal who? Who, who? who is he talking about? What is he? I think if he was here today, he'd say, if you're a false god, little g, whatever it is, really is God, then sell out to it. If your God is God, then go all in on it. In other words, if material possessions, if they're really the most important thing, then, then quit just sort of accumulating them and go for it. Go to town. Use Amazon like crazy and just start ordering things. I mean, get into massive debt. Steal. Steal if you have to. I'm not joking. Like, if it's the greatest thing is accumulation, then everybody should be justified, and stealing would be justified. Everything, just go for it. D don't ever give again, right? Don't ever give. Don't ever do anything generous, uh, because that would then diminish your ultimate goal of accumulating. So if you're going to accumulate material possessions, then go all in. Maybe it's your image. Maybe that's truly God. Then, then don't just kind of do it. I mean, you go to the gym. You go to the gym for three hours in the morning. You go to the gym three hours in the afternoon. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, I'm there. Look at me. I'm jacked up. I mean, if you're going to do it, like, you got you to gotta tweak it and tat it and puff it and tuck it and lift it and twist it and curl it and color it. Funk it. I mean, go to town. Go to town. Maybe it's sexual pleasure. If that's your God, go for it. Go for it. Don't let something as small as a marriage hold you back. I mean, that would be crazy, right? Don't do that. You're not married anymore. So just go. Go to town. Do whatever you want, however you want. Look at what you want. Go after anything you want. The goat. Don't pick a side. Who am I to judge? You do whatever you want because that's your God and you might as well go for it. Your house? Well, maybe that's your God. Quit doing one room at a time, okay? I'm saying go into debt, hire the best interior designer, landscaper, and fix everything at once. Actually, sell your house, buy a new house, and build it from scratch, and then when that's not good enough, do it again and make it bigger and better. Just do it. Those are your things, and quit playing around. Just go for it. Why, why are you riding the fence? But if Christ, the Son of God, is the one true God, then maybe you need to quit your wavering. Maybe you need to serve him with all your hearts. Don't, don't just claim him and then live like he doesn't exist. Serve him. And I could feel the power of Elijah looking directly at me when he's saying, Matt, quit wavering. And here I'm saying to our church, quit wavering. How long will you waver between two opinions? So what did he do? He had this showdown. And he goes, okay, you go get two bulls for me. One bull for you, one bull for me. We're going to build a couple of altars. And we're going to sacrifice these. And we're going to call on your God and my God to burn these sacrifices and see which one's the true God. This is where we pick up the story. In verse 24, it says, You call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the one who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people said, What you say is good. They're like, challenge accepted. 
this is what they were thinking. They were thinking, you're an idiot. Do you know who you're dealing with? We're saying we're going to call on Baal. Baal is the sun god. Hello? Fire is his thing. Hot, fire, sunny. Very much like the last two weeks. You're going to get smoked, silly prophet. Verse 26 says, So they took the bull and they prepared it. And then these prophets, they prepared it and they started to call in the name of Baal from morning till noon. And they're dancing. They're going around, Oh, Baal, answer us. They shouted. But the Bible says there was no response, like nobody answered. And so they danced around that altar that they made louder. Oh, Baal. I can't. Uh, Baal. Uh, Baal. I don't know. I don't, I don't dance. Whatever they're doing, they're screaming. They're, they're sacrifice. They're doing all these things. And they're shrieking in their joy, and nothing happened. Baal, send fire. Nothing happened. And this is, this is what I like. Okay, now, if you know me at all, I'm a little bit sarcastic, and I'm a good trash talker. I could have been Elijah's sidekick in this scenario because then he starts to trash talk them, okay? He starts to get a little bit cocky. And this is funny. This is the man of God, and he starts to mess with them. This is what he says in verse 27. At noon, so he let them go all morning, okay? Sitting back in his, like, chair going, this is amazing. I'm sure he's laughing, looking at them, and he's like, this, if you guys could see yourselves right now, I would put this on YouTube and I would get a billion hits because you guys look dumb. And then at verse 27 at noon, he began to taunt them. Hey, 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 you guys, you guys should shout a little bit louder. I don't think he can hear you. <laughs> Go do it louder. Maybe, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe, maybe somebody needs to go wake up your God. What's he doing? He's messing with them. He's taught. I know he's a god, but maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's taking a little siesta. Maybe he's got milk and cookies. Maybe he's taking a nap. Who knows? But keep calling out to him. And then, then this is when it gets funnier. He said, maybe, maybe he's busy. Maybe he's busy. Now, Maybe he's going to the bathroom. That's what it says. The literal translation in Hebrew says, maybe he's busy. Maybe he's relieving himself. I don't know why potty humor is funny to me. I'm still a juvenile. Now, if you're picturing this, you've got Elijah, the man of God, and he's like, shout louder. Maybe he can't hear you. With a straight face, he's like, Maybe you should start dancing. Maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's on the john. Maybe he's reading the newspaper. And if you read on verse 28 to 35, what did they do? They shouted louder. They danced a little bit wilder. They went crazy. They started to cut themselves because that's what they did. And the scripture says that they shouted and danced all day long. Sadly, though, many of us, we don't dance for false gods all day long, but many of us do it in a lifetime long or a whole lifetime, dancing, praising, pursuing, serving, worshiping the false gods that promise but never deliver. And so finally, at the end of the day, they dance, they cut themselves, and nothing happened. And this is what happens in uh, 1 Kings 1836. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet stepped forward and said, well, he prayed. He just, he, he prayed. He, he didn't dance. He didn't shout. He didn't cut himself. He, 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 he didn't do any of that. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet stepped forward and prayed. See, next week we're going to look into the faith, at the faith and the prayer of uh, life of this awesome man of God in great detail. But he, he prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things in your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know, O Lord, that you are God 
and that you are turning their hearts back again. Can you see the beauty in that, in those statements? Answer me, O Lord. Reveal yourself. Show us who you are. Let us see you. Reveal yourself by fire. We may feel the heat of your love. Show us who you are. Why? So that you may turn the hearts of the people back again. Because they used to know you. They used to walk with you. They used to serve you. They used to worship you. But these false gods have taken place. These, t- these false gods have stepped into their lives and have distracted them and have torn them from you. As I read that, I feel such passion for many of you because there, there are those of you who are in this place and you're in that moment. You're in this place where you're being distracted. You're being torn. You, there's tension. There are things that if you're under spiritual attack, the, Lord, um, the devil wants to take you away and, and distract you and, and pull you away from focusing on God. And oftentimes when things get tough in our lives... We, we often need and know that we need to get closer and spend more time with God, but we actually pull away from God. We pull away from those moments, and we should be praying in and leaning in more, but we pull away and try to figure it out ourselves. God is trying to reveal himself to you so that we can turn our hearts back to him again. And there are some of, and, and there are those of you that, that's why you're here, because God has been working on you. God has been drawing you to church. God has been drawing you to his presence. God has been trying to turn your heart back to him. Now, if you know anything about fire, fire is hot. Fire is hot. And I grew up playing with fire. I used to get in trouble. And if you remember the story, one time I tried to burn down a Holiday Inn in Cambridge, Ontario. Okay, whatever. I didn't do it, but I played with fire. So whoever God is trying to speak to you this morning and reveal himself to you, he's revealing through fire. God, reveal yourself by fire. And so he prays in verse 38. He prays, and this is what happens. Then the fire of the Lord, the fire of the Lord comes down. This lightning rod of fire from heaven And the scripture says it burned up the sacrifice in the wood and the stones and the soil and it licked up all the water around that the false prophets had poured on it and it licked up the water. And and all these people saw this and they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord is God, the Lord, he is God. Can you picture that moment? This would be the prayer for my church, our church, that we would see him for who he is, that all the false gods would fall far away in comparison to the one true God, and that our hearts would be turned back to him, and that we would say, Lord, he is God. Lord, you are God. Imagine if God did that today in our lives where he was able just to come in and burn up the stuff in our lives that distracted us from him. Why doesn't God show himself like that to us today in other ways? I wish he would sometimes. I wish he would be sometimes like the God of the Old Testament who who parted seas and sent fires and did all these crazy things just every once in a while. Like, God, just show yourself to people in a real way. But he doesn't. See, he doesn't because I realized that in much of an infinitely more beautiful way, just how God showed himself to us 2,000 years ago when he left heaven, He became one of us in the person of his son, Jesus, and lived a perfect and sinless life so that he he could die for us on a cross, be raised again so that we could know him. That's how he showed himself. And when you do know him through Christ, then all these false gods that seem to fall away So if Elijah were here today, I think he'd say, Matt, quit wavering. If you know God for who he is, you will never be tempted to serve these false gods again because only, only the one true God is so much greater. 
God, we ask that you would pierce us with that question this morning. That we would be humbled. Lord, that you would give us a spirit of repentance. And we would dethrone all the idols that were standing in place of where you want to be. Let's pray this morning. Maybe somebody here this morning, you're wavering. You know, you're, you're sitting here and you know the idols that you might have in your life. You, you know that you're, you're sitting here and you feel convicted and you know that there are certain things that you have put in place of God. If that's you today, you'd say quite honestly, yes, those are things in my life. They're not giving honor to God and I want to repent. I want to quit wavering and I want to serve him wholeheartedly. If that's you just today, you, I just want you to, to, to give it to God this morning as we continue this prayer. Lord, I pray for these people this morning who feel that. Lord, I, I am in that boat sometimes. And Lord, I need to quit wavering. I need to stop trying to solve my own problems. <laughs> God, I need to stop trying to figure things out on my own. And I, and I need to stop going to other things to replace you. And Lord, for those people who are in here this morning that are feeling that tension, feeling that weight, Lord, I pray that they quit wavering, that they quit going back and forth, Lord, that they put no other God before you, that they, that they just put you on the highest stone. And Lord, I know that I know that, Lord, we will see you do great things in their life. So Lord, I pray somehow, supernaturally, Lord, that you bring fire that you bring fire to burn, you bring fire to, to destroy the things that we put ahead of you. And Lord, we're, we're going to see you move in wonderful, great ways. So Lord, I am just claiming and believing for freedom this morning. No hype, no music. Lord, I just, I just believe that you're going to do amazing things. Lord, let it even start today that the fire of the Holy Spirit will, will cleanse us and do what only you can do, Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings. Lord, we put no other gods before you. Your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.